So this video is going to be covering chapter 20, section 2, which deals with voltaic cells. Now, voltaic cells, as a quick definition, are cells in electrochemistry, like we just covered, that use redox reactions to convert chemical energy, which I'll write as E-chem, into electrical energy, as I'll write as EE. And these are things, you know, like the typical Duracells, the tiny uh, round batteries, the mercury batteries that are in your watches, things you use to power small portable devices every day, and even to start your car. And just as we discussed in the previous video, with the zinc copper battery, in which the zinc was the anode and copper the cathode, all these following batteries, despite, you know, varying types of uh, different compounds, in this case X and Y, that will be making up the anode and cathode of the battery. They all have, you know, electron transfer from anode to cathode, creating a current, usually symbolized in physics by I, uh, in amps, that can power small electronic devices. Now I'm going to be discussing various different types of cells, wet cells and dry cells. Uh, but for a detailed detailed diagrams of each of the types I'm going to be discussing, you can refer to page 659 and 660 of your book. The first type of battery we're going to be looking at are what are known as zinc carbon dry cells, and these are the typical big D batteries that you put in like a large flashlight or what have you. And the, you, these use, as you could guess from the name, uh, zinc and carbon, more specifically the whole zinc jacket out here acts as the anode, as you can see written right here. The zinc can itself is the anode, and so the electrons flow, you know, out of this jacket, down and up into this carbon rod here, and the carbon is what acts as the cathode in this paste, this case rather, and in between them is this paste and this paste is comprised of various electrolytic chemicals in this case you know zinc chloride ions because you need the zinc ions in solution as well as manganese oxide and ammonium chloride and all these break up into ions in that uh, paste solution to conduct electricity well. Moving on now we're going to be discussing alkaline batteries and these are typically the AA and AAA batteries you use in small toys and whatnot you get for Christmas or whatever. So in this case you have a zinc anode uh, right in here and then this tiny layer right outside the zinc anode is basically the salt bridge. It's the, it's the ion solution separating it from a uh, cathode out here, usually made of some sort of manganese oxide or what have you. And then the current flows. This uh, rod in here picks up the current and conducts it out to the circuit where it can be used for powering whatever. Moving on now to mercury batteries. These are the small batteries you normally find in, you know, watches or hearing aids. Uh, we have a diagram over here on the right, and you can see that it has a steel cathode, so it uses iron, and then the anode is once again zinc. You'll notice that zinc is a very good uh, anode because it's readily oxidized. In this case, uh, they use all up in here a strong oxidizing agent, which is mercury oxide, as well as some uh, potassium hydroxide as, and some zinc hydroxide just to get the proper ions in there for uh, oxidizing the zinc in the anode. Lastly we have fuel cells which are extremely efficient, albeit uh, somewhat hard to build, and these are used by uh, NASA on the space station and what have you. So they take hydrogen fuel, input it, which then uh, ionizes to form H plus and some electrons. Now these electrons go through a circuit where you know their energy is used as electricity to power whatever you need powering and then on the opposite end you have oxygen that comes in 
Now this oxygen combines with uh, water that you have in here in the middle uh, in some sort of membrane as well as the free electrons from the circuit to form negative hydroxide. Now this hydroxide can then act as a ion in solution and complete the circuit carrying it back to the hydrogen where it is then uh, neutralized into water. Moving on now to uh, corrosion. The most common type of corrosion you're going to see every day is uh, the rust of iron in the presence of oxygen. Basically you take metallic iron like you'd have on your car and uh, combine it with oxygen in the air and some amount of water. That's what this X means. Uh, basically this water is what's going to hydrate the iron oxide that forms. And however much water determined by this coefficient X hydrates that iron oxide is going to determine properties like the color, the strength of the rust, etc. And here we have a reaction for uh, the rust of iron, or at least the two half reactions in this sort of voltaic cell, if you will. Uh, you have, you know, the iron being oxidized, as well as the oxygen itself being reduced by gaining these four electrons. And what's interesting is that in the corrosion of iron in the presence of water, you have all the ingredients just in these three compounds to uh, you know, react. You have iron, which itself acts as the conducting wire, like the one that we had connecting the zinc and copper in the earlier video, as well as the oxygen, which because it naturally forms hydronium and hydroxide in albeit small concentrations, acts as a salt bridge. And if you add salt into the mix, for example, when they salt roads uh, with uh, sodium and potassium chloride to uh, melt snow faster. If that gets up into you know into the water that's covering your truck from all the snow or whatnot, these will increase the reaction rate, the rust rate in this case, because there's uh, more ions in the solution. It's not just the hydronium and hydroxide any longer. You have chlorine and sodium ions conducting the current. Now to prevent this, people will often, you know, if you have your metal bed of your truck or the bottom of a boat or what have you, they'll add bars of zinc along the bottom to prevent this corrosion. And this is what is called cathodic or cathodic protection. In this case, uh, the zinc, because it is, you know, more readily oxidized, will uh, corrode first. So this zinc will, you know, get the holes in it, etc., from all that uh, zinc oxide being formed and falling off. Whereas this iron will remain pristine down here as long as you have zinc to corrode before it. In this case, the zinc acts as what is known as a sacrificial anode. In other words, it's the anode that is readily oxidized first to save this iron from rust. So moving on now, we're going to be discussing electrical potential. And as we've already said, uh, if you have, let's say, this copper zinc circuit, electrons will be uh, sort of pulled, as drawn here, from uh, where zinc is oxidized and the electrons are let go to where the copper uh, is reduced. And this pull is what is known as electrical potential. And much like gravitational potential, uh, they'll move from an area of high potential to an area of low potential just like as water flows uh, downhill from an area of high gravitational potential energy to an area of low gravitational potential uh, potential energy. And this electrical uh, potential is usually measured in volts, which is, uh, you know, how much energy each of these electrons has 
per unit charge, usually given by Q. Moving on now, we're going to be discussing individual electrode potentials. So, for example, uh, in this zinc copper reaction that we use as sort of the prime example, uh, the two metals have a different tendency to accept electrons. In other words, this copper will take the electrons more readily. That's why the electrons flow from the zinc into the copper and form, you know, the solid copper down here. And this is because it has a higher reduction potential, which is the tendency for a half reaction to occur as reduction. There also exists something called electrode potential, and the electrode potential is the difference in potential between the electrode and the solution. In this case, that would be, you know, the copper and the copper sulfate, or the, the copper ions in solution. So, when connected completely in this circuit and you have the ions flowing and whatnot, uh, the difference in potential that exists between the cathode and the anode is proportional to the energy. In other words, you know, uh, the potential is basically a measure of the total energy pushing these charges around the system. And the potential across the whole cell that is, you know, the potential from here all the way around is equal to the potential across these two, uh, you know, uh, electrodes. Because for all intents and purposes, there's very little resistance going on here. There's very little uh, change in energy given to each of the charges. Now, it's difficult to uh, calculate individual electrode potentials because you need this whole system working simultaneously to measure one. For example, if you were to take out the zinc, uh, then there'd be no electron flow and you can't measure the electrode potential of the copper cathode. So you need the whole system going. However, to measure the actual potential of one half cell, half cell you can connect, connect it to what is known as a standard hydrogen uh, electrode. And now a standard hydrogen electrode uh, basically has a tube of hydrogen that uh, will ionize into H plus ions and uh, electrons as part of a standard anodic reaction. In other words, you can measure how uh, quickly a half cell will oxidize this hydrogen. And this measure is what is known as the standard electrode potential. And so all electrodes are measured relative to the standard hydrogen electrode. Oops, just move that back up there. Yeah, all uh, half cells are measured relative to this standard hydrogen electrode to get their standard electrode potential. And because the standard electrode potential is a measure of the reduction potential relative to the standard hydrogen electrode, those that uh, oxidize more readily, for example, uh, lithium and zinc will have uh, negative standard electrode potentials because they don't reduce hydrogen, they actually uh, oxidize in its presence.